Yeah, it's kind of a question of decorum, isn't it? It's like you want to make major changes to any industry, surely having some figures and data that says, okay, we think that this is going to be the impact, you know, X, Y, Z is going to be the impact. But, you know, we also take into consideration ABC, you know, he, you know here's this upside to it and, and this is going to be positive. But the fact that none of that work seems to have been done just must be ringing alarm bells just about good process. And, and we've seen that the whole way through this, how we've got providers that are closing campuses, literally closing down campuses and sacking people. And we haven't even got a piece of legislation through the parliament. That to me just stinks that something is wrong, wrong, wrong in the way that this has been done. No, I agree. G'day, I'm Jack Wilder, founder of the Koala News, coming to you from Wadjuk Noongar Country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki, the CEO of the Global Society, coming today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And of course, it's that time of year where the days are getting long, feels like summer is just around the corner. And Dirk, we are going to get on and talk about the big news today, of course, is that the fourth day of the Senate hearings into the ESOS legislation have just taken place. We're going to break that apart, aren't we, Dirk? We sure are. We sure are, Rob. Looking forward to that. And lots of news to discuss, but because it is that lovely time of year when it's getting warmer and it feels like summer holidays are sneaking up on us, we thought we might open today's episode by talking about the best thing on the calendar and some really good news, and that is the AIEC conference, which is sneaking up in just a few weeks. Mate, three and weeks. in order to counting down, three weeks is coming up real soon. And to join us on the podcast to sort of get into some of the details, a lady who is probably starting to feel, feel some of the pressure, the conference whisperer herself, Shamila Tofi from IDP. Sham, awesome to have you on the Global Horizons podcast. Thanks, uh, Rob and Dirk. It's lovely to be here today. Hoping I could give you some sneaker peeks on some of the th- upcoming AIEC happenings. We do like a sneak peek. And this conference, we were just talking about this off camera. This is maybe the most important AIEC conference that the Australian international education industry has ever has ever had, I think, with these enormous changes that are, are being proposed. There's never been a more important time to be there. But I just got an email from, from the AIEC with an interesting announcement, very important announcement about some of the special speakers that are going to be joining us. Yes, and it's interesting you say that with the policy changes and all the things happening in the sector, we are pleased to announce that the Minister for Education, the Honourable Jason Clare, has agreed to talk at this year's AIEC. That's going to be interesting timing, Sham, given the Senate committee reports next week and the bill will be going through Parliament. So it's going to be perfect timing for the Minister to be talking to the sector. Yes, yes. It's quite exciting to hear what he's going to have to say to a room full of international educators. We're really looking forward to that. We've also got the Assistant Minister Tim Watts appearing as well at AIEC this year. So it looks like an interesting lineup. I'm not going to say any more. There may be additional speakers coming up still, but I will keep you in suspense there. Tim Watts will also be an interesting one, given the fact that the new Colombo changes have, have just come through. And given his portfolio in foreign affairs, I think there might be some interesting stuff there too. There's some very interesting information that will be shared. Looking forward to that. We don't get the details, but we certainly anticipate Tim Watts, yeah, interestingly, so New Colombo Plan changes that you've just alluded there, Dirk. For those people who aren't familiar with New Colombo Plan, Australian government program to support Australian university students to have international study experiences in the Indo-Pacific region. And Tim Watts was recently announced he's going to be conducting a review of the NCP, so looking at how it's functioning and what can perhaps be improved with the NCP, which is big news. It'll be great to hear where his thinking is heading. That's a real privilege for people inside the industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. What else can we expect, Sham? Give us more good news. We talked a couple of times on the podcast already about the conference dinner. Hollywood Nights is the theme. Have you got your outfit already? Oh, all the glitz and glamour. Looking forward to the red carpet. We're all stars that night. I haven't got my outfit, but I'm going through ideas. I've heard ideas on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've heard ideas about Miami Vice coming. My own one is tossing up whether I do a Kim Kardashian look with the uh, champagne glass. So still deciding on that one. The jury's still out on what I'll wear that night. Have you got yours, Rob? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I've got a rule now. As soon as I see the conference dinner theme, the first thing that comes into my mind is the costume that I'm going to go with. 
some years that comes out a little bit unusual and uh, I've kind of <laughs> almost regretted as I've been getting into my costume. Like, what the hell is wrong with me? What's wrong with you, Maliki? What are you doing? This year, I'm feeling pretty comfortable with my choice. I'm glad the thing that came into my mind after I read the conference dinner theme, I went, oh yeah, I can deliver on that one for sure. So I'm feeling very good. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I might give the paparazzi a heads up. Yeah, you give them a the heads up. <laughs> Actually, I, did, I think I showed this in the last one too for those people who are um, watching along and I've got this little Oscar statuette, so it's going to be with me as a prop, I believe. This came into my possession just by happenstance right around the time that the conference dinner theme was announced. So I think, how's that for luck? Oh, look at that. The perfect prop at the perfect time. Oh, mate, I'm picturing gold body paint on you now. Oh, stop yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Vaninsky, <laughs> we're calling you out, buddy. <laughs> Ooh. Interesting, interesting. I had a chat with Alec. He's all sorted, so you might just, yeah, be your competition. Ah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. There's a bit of yeah. hot competition with Alec. What else can we expect? There's some really new fun stuff coming up this year, some stuff to keep people going. So what else we got? Talking about fun stuff, we are launching a conference quest. So if you're one of those people that love puzzles, love solving riddles, looking for clues, this is something that's going to keep you interested in the conference and all its happenings. You may learn something that you've never thought we offered at AIC. We will launch on the 22nd of October during the orientation session. If you are booked in for that, we will have a little bit of talking about how it works. There are some lovely prizes. Our website will be updated later this week with the conference prizes up for grabs. It is going to take you on a journey through the conference over the Tuesday to the Friday. There'll be videos, there'll be selfies, there'll be riddles to solve. And the big prize, which is sponsored by Adelaide Uni, is a accommodation a weekend away at um, in South Australia. So it's, it's really something to look forward to with a number of consolation prizes as well. But here's the trick. You have to be there Friday afternoon to claim your prize. So you have to be in the audience at the closing plenary if your name is called as the winner. So there you go. I think if you're in the mix, that's a really good incentive to hang around. Oh, yeah. And it's a really great prize. Second prize is an Apple iPad. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so, you know, if you're in the market for one of those, there's your incentive to play. Absolutely. Give us a little behind the scenes look. You're the conference manager. Three weeks to go. What sort of things are you getting into now? Like, What are your, the big things that you're working on, putting into place, etc.? Big details are just coordination, logistics coordination. We have everybody um, trying to get into the socials. As you know, the socials are booked out. They get booked out very quickly. So if you don't register and get a place, you're on a wait list. So got to wait for a place to come up. There is some interesting sessions. We're working on all our different formats, the cafes, the inspires, the campfires, which have become very popular, very popular sessions, making sure that all our speakers are good to go, making sure that all our keynote speakers are good to go and that everything is in place for that. We have a number of activations. As you know, our exhibition hall is very popular. We have everything from snacks to gelato to massage lounge to photo booths to get your hair and makeup done if you want to redo your your portrait, your your headshots. Yeah, yep, yeah, your headshots. So it's just coordinating the logistics to make sure that everything's in place, ready to go. The designs are done and everything's in production now. So it's literally ticking off the checklist and dealing with any cancellations or any changes that come about. But exciting times because you get to see it come alive. You get to see the design work. You get to see the planning, the strategy all come to life in the next Three weeks and releasing the information to the public every now and again just makes it all that exciting that it's so real it's really going to happen yeah nice so day in the life of conference manager are you just on you know meeting after meeting call after call double checking cross-checking delegating that sort of thing lots of emails exactly yeah exactly it is meeting after meeting it is making decisions making a call deciding on something sometimes it's simple sometimes it's harder sometimes it involves the whole team it is quite interesting how this huge huge conference comes together and the teams that work together to bring it to life i'm quite excited it's my first aic conference that i'm that i'm managing so really really exciting big shoes that i had to fill but quite quite good yeah 
So, Shan, I understand there's a sensory room that AAC is going to employ for the first time this year. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes, we have um, experienced this before at other other conferences. And just given the enormity of AAC and all the exciting happenings around, it, we thought it would be fitting to have a quiet space, a space that you could just switch off and do some mindfulness and, and reflecting, a quiet space to do anything away from all the crowds. So there's a dedicated space on level one at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre for AIEC. Um, so be sure to check it out. Can I be really honest? Yep. At every single AIEC I think I've been to, I always hit this point mid-afternoon where I'm just absolutely knackered and need <laughs> just some downtime. And I'll <laughs> almost invariably go and find myself a little corner somewhere, like a little couch or a little corner where I can just lie down and have a nap. This is for real. I'm surprised nobody's ever gotten a photo of me just crashed out somewhere in the corner. So I, I think I'll definitely be one of those people taking advantage of that. If we're sharing that. a booth this year, I'm going to ask you, are you going for your nap and I'm going to follow you. Do we know where to find you? We know we definitely know where to find you. You know where to find me now. If, if you go by the, go, come by the Global Horizons booth and Maliki is not there, you know where to go looking. Like, right, okay. <laughs> Love it. What a great initiative. I mean, once again, we've talked so many times about how it's just a conf always moving forward. Yeah, it's always something new in there. There's some little adaption. There's something new to you know make it even better. So hats off. Thank you. And Shem, tell us through, talk us through, so the, the days leading up to it. When So you're based in Sydney, conference yes. is in Melbourne. When will you actually travel down to Melbourne and be on the site? Are you, are you there like the week before or are you there a few days before? I'm only a few days before. I will travel to Sydney on the Sunday, uh, sorry, to Melbourne on the Sunday, and hopefully everything will be sort of in place by then. Monday, we do walk arounds, you know, tick the boxes, make sure that everything we've asked for is all good. We get ready for kickoff on Tuesday, and there's a number of rehearsals, number of meetings that still go ahead before we open our doors at one o'clock on Tuesday, the 22nd of October. Yeah, it's awesome. Actually, out of curiosity, so now we're down into the details. I love the detail of this sort of stuff because you never get to see behind this curtain, do you? When does the actual setup begin inside the conference hall? Does that start happening on the Monday before, or is it already starting to happen over the weekend? That's correct. It happens on the Monday before. So it is phenomenal how the teams put together something and opens up a complete exhibition for you on Tuesday afternoon. It is just amazing how how it all comes together. I was going to say, you almost want one of those like slow scape kind of cameras to see it all come together and then build that out, you know. You know, we do have that. We yeah, do have amazing. that for the exhibition build. So, and we will sort of pop that up uh, during the week. You'll you'll be able to see how it all came together. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's when you I always marvel when you walk around a conference like this, and you walk through the expo hall, and you walk through the registration desk, and then you go to sessions. Every single one of those moments has required decisions to be made and work to be done. Every little detail from the number of chairs inside a particular room, you know, where the banners go, the whole lot has to be decided. That's just such a phenomenal amount of work. Even the type of chairs has to be decided on. It is phenomenal. When you look at those screens, what you see on those screens needs to be decided on. The titles of those screens, the fonts, it goes down to the to the detail, detail of checking all those guidelines and making sure that's what we deliver on. And I think once again, when people do rock up and they just see how smoothly it runs, the amount of work that's gone into the back end of that is, is incredible. So I'm always having an enormous amount of gratitude to you, Sham, and to everybody on, on the team at IDP who pulled together such an incredible experience. And once again, for those people listening on, this is the year that you've got to be at AOIEC. There's never been a more important time, whether you're on the inbound side of international ed or the outbound or the teaching and learning side. This is so critical to be there. Sham, if people still want to sign up, it's not too late to pre-register. Where do they go? You go to aiec.idp.com and navigate to the registration page. We have tipped, as we said, 1,600 registrations. So we will close registrations on the 17th of October. So now's your chance to get in or you're going to miss out. Yeah, and if you've got any budget left, think about your budget next year. You might not have it. This is literally the time to be there. Make sure you get there. Now is the time. Now is definitely, definitely the time to come uh, to AIC. Awesome to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. And I think the next time we will see you is going to be on the ground in Melbourne, which we're really looking forward to. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Dirk and Rob. And also just a little hint, there is a quest task related to what you'll be doing at AIC. So if there's anybody listening, that's just a heads up. Awesome. Thank you so much for having <laughs> Great me. Great to have you here, Sam.
Thanks. Thanks. Enjoy the show. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIEC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at AIEC.idp.com. Oh, it was great having Sham on, wasn't it, Dirk? Sure was, Rob. I just love hearing that behind the scenes sort of stuff. It's the kind of insight that you never really get to hear about, even though it plays such an important and critical role in, in getting something like the conference off the ground. But now let's get to the, the meaty part of the week. And of course, yesterday we had the fourth hearing of the Senate committee looking at this legislation that's before the parliament at the moment. You were out with popcorn once again. <laughs> How did it unfold? Yeah, mate, it's really interesting. Number four, and, uh, you know, I guess it was unexpected, which kind of made it really interesting to see the program go up, to see who was being called, and then to see what kind of, I guess, the, the senator's questioning line was going to be. After three of them already, you'd think the senators would probably have enough information to go on to, to make recommendations. I think it became really clear through the hearing that the senators have genuine concerns about not maybe so much about, you know, the, the highlighted material, but the actual implementation of it. They really concentrated on the implementation of it, particularly around the formula, particularly around VET programs and, and the VET providers and their ability to actually be solvent moving forward. That clearly came through with, with Senator Henderson and Faruqi in their line of questioning. It was a really interesting day. I don't know, mate. Do you want to do you want to break it down? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple of highlights maybe, but it looked like a few few people got grilled, a few grillings, in yeah. there, a few roastings. No, absolutely. I look. I mean, rather than starting with the grill, let's leave that bit to the end. But the performers of the day, you know, I think. I mean, the day started with Dr. Makesh. Chanda, who's the CEO of Imperial Engineering Education Adelaide, a really good opening for the day. You know, here's a college that literally only in April was Krikos registered for 275 students and their cap allocation is 10. So some of the questioning, you know, um, Mikesh gave a, a really good introduction and, and set the scene really well. Some of the questioning then became around well, solvency and what does it actually take to start up a business and what are the ideals or the, or the strategic endeavours? And obviously being based in Adelaide and, you know, AUKUS being on the on the front door there, that was a really big area. They're talking about energy production, about advanced manufacturing and about fitting into the, the future jobscape in, in Adelaide. One of the really interesting bits that came out was that in getting the college up and running, they've already invested $3.5 million. Their original strategic plan saw that being recouped in four to five years. Remember, that's based on 275, a cap of 275 students and also uh, registration for domestic students, you know, coming on, online as well. Clearly, that ROI will... <laughs> will take a lot, lot longer to be met with a, with a cap of 10. And one really probably needs to suspect whether that's financially viable moving forward. So it was a fantastic case study to open up the day and really set the scene for, you know, some of the, I guess, just the baseline kind of solvency issues that a lot of these private educators are now going to face. Let's unpack that a little bit because until I read your article in the Koala this morning in preparation for this conversation, where... That's mentioned several times, talking about the solvency requirements under under TEXA. And I wasn't even aware of that. I mean, it makes complete sense. But suddenly there's this massive pressing, pressing issue that probably most people weren't even aware of. Do you want to unpack that a little bit for people? Yeah, according to the regulations, obviously TEXA have oversight to uh, on a number of regulatory issues. One of those is around financial, the technical, the actual term is financial viability. And so it came out later in another session where was the head of TEXA, Mary, uh, Dr. Mary, Dr. Mary, um, was asked about letters that TEXA had sent to a number of providers uh, referencing the future moving forward and their financial viability. Now, it came out later that some of these may have already been on notice. But yeah, there's a requirement there that, you know, Texas has got to overlook and ensure that, again, when we talk about Texas, we're talking about higher education now, not VET. Um, that, that would be ASQA. But certainly in a higher education context, that educational institutions need to have a strong financial viability. So it is going to cause a lot of issues. And that was certainly picked up by Henderson and Faruqi. It's incredible is that we have a regulator that's sending letters out to providers questioning their financial viability. And yet this legislation hasn't even passed the parliament. And that was picked up in, in some of the comments, was it not? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, I mean, I, th I think most of that sentiment has been on the side of the providers up until this point, but I think it became very clear that a number of senators are now starting to get the picture that, you know, these changes if brought in or the, and the actions of government in preparation, if I can put it that way. And it's a very fine line, I think. I was even confused at some points throughout the hearing. It was a very easy get out of jail free card for a number of witnesses to say, well, these are proposed changes. They're not actual changes. But the sector is looking at these as this is going to be the deal if that legislation passes. It's like an overlapping situation at the moment where how do you plan when you've been given a set of figures or you've been given a, a map to kind of to go on, but then the people who are providing the map are going, well, that's not really the map because the legislation hasn't yeah. passed. Map. It's a scenario it's a that- Proposed map. Yeah, proposed map. <laughs> it's probably a scenario that this sector has never seen before. So it, you know, it's brand new ground and it's really concerning. Not just this sector though, Dirk. I mean, I can't remember a time where any industry has been thrown into this situation where in the space of what's now three months, they're now being completely turned up by down. I just don't see how any other sector, you know, a government would get away with this kind of behaviour and not it being all over the newspapers to have an opposition absolutely tearing them to pieces. Whether it's small business, big business, banks, mining, you name it, it really, yeah. it, it, to me, it seems unprecedented. Yeah, you're right. And look, the, I guess you know, we've heard probably analyses or, or comparisons to the mining sector, you know, where, you know, there might be futures sold in advance and the ships are being turned around and, you know, in government intervention in that sense. Another example that actually Trevor Goddard brought up with me just really probably about two, three weeks ago was if you compared that to, say, the accommodation sector, hotels, right? And if you were to say, you know, the, the big names around town, you know, the intercontinentals and the Sheratons are kind of like universities, but then you've got all these bespoke accommodation providers. And imagine if the government came in and said, you know, Sheraton, you can only have 80% of your of your floor capacity or bed capacity moving forward. And then bespoke providers, you can only have 10% of, of your capacity moving forward. And it's the same kind of scenario because you've got these people who are on investment, you know, investment runs that might be five or 10 years out. So you've got these massive companies putting in lots of money and now suddenly your income is being controlled, eroded, decreased without your ability to impact that. So it has massive consequences, you know, and ripples right across. So it's a fact, I thought Trevor's analysis analogy was, was fantastic. Analogy. All right, so we don't move on to then after the first session. The second session involved the Independent Tertiary Council of Australia, ITECA, and that was Troy Williams and Felix Perry. And I think from memory, this is the third time that Felix has appeared. So um, he's become quite the performer. And I really love Felix's commentary, actually. He's very much to the point, kind of takes the you know, all the, the kind of emotion out of it and just gets down to actually what the what the consequences are. TAFE Directors Australia appeared via video conference. That was Jenny Dodd. And then, of course, someone I think we've had on this podcast before, Claire Field made an appearance. And Claire was well, probably one of the shining stars of the day. Claire outlined a bunch of research that she had done and was asked to refer to it by the Senate committee. And so she gave a bunch of figures. And I'll just I'll rattle them off quickly because I think they're really, really important. 11 providers, with one additional since she did the research, the equivalent of 1,400 29 places have been given caps and they're currently being cancelled by ASQA and appealing to the AAT. So when you talk about, and I'm conscious of, of, you know, pointing the bone or legal ramifications, potential bad actors that obviously have been sanctioned and cancelled by ASQA receiving caps, when this is an integrity and quality bill, I mean, it, there's a big question mark there. Now, that was brought up later in the day with the department with uh, Dewa who actually uh, issued that and they were saying that they issued those on with a natural justice component so if the AAT upholds the cancellation those numbers will be withdrawn but they're working on the premise that if they do get through there's an allocation there for them if their appeal is, is upheld then there'll be an allocation for them again really interesting point that you know people who in, in an integrity context that people who potentially bad actors have been given, you know, a decent allocation. Then there were 10 providers that have been provided caps above their Crycos registration, and one didn't even provide VET programs. I mean, this is kind of, to me, yeah, and again, in the questioning, this was brought up, the view of DWA or Department of Employment Workplace Relations was that these figures aren't at all related. So if you think there's a Crycos registration number, and that is your capacity at any one point in time in enrolments, whereas the cap is a commencement figure. So the way that they explained it was if you're running shorter programs, you know, it might be a three-month diploma, which, you know, Claire argued 
that's probably not a good thing. But if you're running a three-month diploma, you might actually have four of those commencements. But when you cut it at any one point, there's only one counted, if that makes sense. So there may be a rationale for that. But again, it's, it's just not a good look, is it? Like when you think generally about programs, you think they are there for the for the area. Maybe it does explain it, but I think that one probably needs a little bit more teasing out and a little bit more data around what providers and why and whether that explanation matches up against those 10 providers. So, so that'll be an interesting one. And then there were 79 providers with a cap of 30 who have not provided for international students for more than six years, potentially. So basically people be given caps when they aren't even using them, aren't even delivering programs for international students. I think that that's the reference, right? But they've been given... So essentially, it's been communicated that anyone who hasn't had international students or is new, so they haven't, zero, they would get a baseline cap of 30. So these 79 have been brought into, into that area. So this example that you've just given, Dr. Chanda... Ooh. I mean, essentially, they're new, right? They've just... Anomaly, just right? Yeah, up. totally. And that's, that, and that's the anomaly. In, but they, so they haven't even been given the minimum cap of 30, even though they're a brand new provider. Correct. Yeah, and that, that's one of the anomalies. And then the last group was 192 providers. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? So 192 providers have a cap of 10 or less. I mean, that's you can't run a business on 10 or less. And the view was that they would fa face financial viability issues, as per the example that I gave earlier and you just mentioned Imperial in Adelaide, where how do you run a business on, on 10 commencements? So there's 192 in that boat. So you've got to think... You know, their, their backs are really up against the wall. And again, later on, Henderson made some really specific comments around, you know, the consequences and the catastrophic consequences that are, are facing these the, that group of people right now. They're, they're Australian businesses that essentially are going to be facing, you know, closure. From what I gathered from your article this morning, it seems like a lot of those businesses are in regional areas, which is... You know, supposedly the area that the government is looking to support by getting more students to the area, but we've got a lot of businesses, a lot of training providers in those areas that, that are impacted. And there were some examples, weren't there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in two sessions time, there was a, a panel with two airlines, so two, sorry, flight training providers. Their name was, was Basser Air Flight Training Adelaide, but they were joined by IH Sydney, International House Sydney, and Lexus Education, as well as, sorry, there was a third uh, aviation Moravan, and they were via video conference. But Ian Pratt of Lexus made this point really, really well, followed up by uh, with Tim Eckenfeld and Mark Raven from IH. The return on investment in the city areas is much greater than what it is in regional areas. So getting students to Sydney or Melbourne, you know, it's more popular, it's easier. And so being able to run education offerings from, from the major cities is easier. IH Sydney have already announced their closure of their Byron Bay operation, which I believe will close in December. Ian Pratt went to great lengths to talk about a called the Culinary Institute, I believe, a subset of Lexus Education and the struggles that he has in regional areas from the and, and it's probably a bigger thing than just it's harder to do this in regional areas but the regional area training provides services to regional areas so in Ian's case the culinary institute you know he's obviously doing a whole bunch of hospitality stuff from chefing you know right, right through the gamut there's a need for that and Ian's on the Sunshine Coast around Noosa there's a need for that in the local area so on one hand it's harder to get students there. It's harder to do that. Costs are higher. But what actually happens when that closes down? And what happens to the local community? So the people that are going through these places, whether they're domestic or international, and whether they might, you know, if they're international, whether they might be able to move towards PR or even just post-study work, they're generally going to stick and be around. If there's jobs in the area, which clearly there are in that area because there's a need and it's been successful, then that's a really, I mean, it's just a double whammy, isn't it? So that community's losing out as well as the provider losing out because they've been hamstrung or choked by these caps. So again, Ian, Ian Pratt did marvellously well in that. Similarly, Mark Raven, I think it was, spoke about the financial viability coming into question for other operations that they have. So they, I, from memory, it was Darwin, Adelaide and one other location that they're going to have to start looking at in all seriousness um, over the next little bit to see whether they will be financially viable moving forward. Again, that regional, what probably was set out earlier about trying to get students out of the cities and into the regions is actually having the converse effect in this scenario when we talk about vet providers. It's it's fascinating. Moving on. I really wonder what that what that does inside the government government circles. If if that kind of argument actually resonates and someone pauses and turns around and goes, Oh God, we didn't think about that. 
maybe we need to take another look. Or if it's just one of those things, they're just like, look, for political reasons, we have to get this thing through to demonstrate that we're doing something about immigration. Well, that's, yeah. We'll just have to hoover those up when, when the time comes. Mate, I think you've just nailed, hit the nail on the head and, you know, Claire Field referenced that as well. I don't, I don't think the intention, well, I shouldn't say the intention. The intention isn't to necessarily mess all this up, but they've got themselves in a, in a situation where it's become really messy. Like, and the, the example that, that really demonstrates this is particularly the two flight training schools. So Bass Air and Adelaide Training, Flight Training Adelaide, made really strong cases around, and particularly uh, Flight Training Adelaide. Johan Pina is the CEO there, made a really, really good case. You know, they've got contracts with eight airlines offshore they're all sponsored students. And when I say sponsored, not, you know, they're brought in by the airlines. They're chosen offshore. They live on site. There's no housing implication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If this goes ahead, I mean, all three of them, so they're financially viable, like the financial viability of all of this is just shot. And flight training in this country is in jeopardy. And, you know, that's something that Henderson picked up on really, really well. And there is an acknowledgement by government that there, I think the term they used is that this part of the sector has unique circumstances. So again, until the, it's almost like whack-a-mole, you know, these roll out something blanket wise, and then they're looking for, you know, the mole to pop up. So they go, oh, didn't think of that. Maybe we need to address that. And there's clearly pressure now coming from the Senate committee, particularly around air training services, but also now looking at, well, hang on, if it's happening to air training services, whoa. Let's just pause there for a sec. Where else could it be happening? And if we rush this through, what's the damage? What's the collateral damage that comes out of this? Again, it was that was a fascinating session, I've got to say. And all of the witnesses called in that session performed exceptionally well. The one I'd like to get to, because you gave him quite a rap, call him the star, star of the session, John Demretti, who's the CEO of the Academy of Interactive Entertainment was one of the next sessions up, the, the sort of 10.45. But you gave him quite a lot of kudos for, for the way that he performed in front of the committee. Mate, I did. Again, following on from that previous session, this session was of a, of a similar ilk. And John, all of them did really, really well at, at being able to explain their situation, explain the impact. John probably went up and beyond because he was probably a little bit more forceful. And Senator... Billick, who's a Labor senator, actually asked him, asked him a question about the startup nature and all the rest. And in that conversation, I mean, John was clearly across his brief. He knows what he's doing. He's obviously a very high performer. Kind of gave the senator a bit of a lesson in international education. It was, I mean, from a senator's point of view, who's on a committee that's interrogating this stuff, it was actually kind of embarrassing. But yeah, she, you know, asking questions around investment and why don't you have students? And well, because we've just been Krakos registered and there's of, and then talking about agents and what do you do and can I, I'd like to see your contracts. I mean, this is all baseline stuff, right? This is really baseline stuff. But she was looking for an angle and she just didn't find it because John was just was so good at being able to articulate why this bill is just bad and the struggles that he's doing. The other thing, I guess, is he's looking at investments in a campus in, in Canberra. So he, he really laid it out really easy. I think it was 40 million was the first investment, including 600 beds of accommodation. So when you talk about the, take the context of, you know, the last six months and, you know, housing and, you know, the George Williams view from Western Sydney about, you know, the accommodation thing being brought into that discussion, which we all thought it would be, but it wasn't. You know, here's a guy who is obviously very well, you know, very well off. He's been successful in this area. You know, he gave examples about how his students are, you know, in the running for Academy Awards and how their students are in movies and, you know, the really practical outcome nature of of the work that he does in that interactive space. So yeah, initially 40 million in a Canberra for a new campus, but that's stage one. He was saying it's up to 200 million that, that they're going to pump in over, you know, a, I want to say it was a five-year period, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. But that's this is the scenario. And he's saying, well, why would I do that? Why would I invest this money if you are going to tell me I can't run a successful business? And he's absolutely right. Then he, I mean, the guy obviously it runs a global business. So he has, you know, sites in, I think it was the US uh, and a couple of other countries where he's working with their governments and their governments are actually supporting and assistance. And he made this comment that just rang home, which was, but my home country is against me. It was just, you know, you, when you paint it that, that way, it was just, you know, it was just a cut through moment where you could hear a pin drop and you go, those countries over there, they're actually 
doing what we should be doing and we're just looking really silly right now. So, John, yeah, mate, I'm massive, massive fan of, uh, of John. It's the first time I've ever seen him speak, but really on point, really clear and gave really good examples and, you know, put the senator in a place where, you know, not intentionally, but just through the content, just made the senator look a little bit silly. Yeah, and I guess that's something that a lot of people don't think about as those investment decisions, and that's money that's being actively invested here in our economy, not just to recruit students, but, you know, that's also upskilling Australians, international students, some of whom will remain here and fill valuable roles in the workforce because that's what our visa system has been sort of configured to do. But of course, if that investment is the front end of that whole pipeline, you take that out or you create dramatic uncertainty around that pipeline and the investment suddenly is gone, the pipeline of those skills is gone. And it's one of these things that five years time, we turn around and look around and went, God, like, why are our skills gaps widening? Oh, yep. hang on. That's because <laughs> oh, we shot ourselves in the foot. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, Dr. B.O. from uh, the Institute of Health and Management made that point. Yeah, and he, he was really focusing on health professionals, particularly nurses. Like what is going to happen in five years time when, you know, all these providers are, are no longer producing nurses? What's the scenario going to be? The stand-up time frame for, these, for a college isn't six months. You're talking years yeah, right. and then you've got the recruitment and then you've got the whole pipeline to get those students through and out in the workforce. It's, it's literally creating a backlog of well, you know, a widening skills gap that's going to be entrenched for a decade. Um, but let's move on. Let's yeah. move on. Let's start talking some of the bureaucrat side of things because after lunch, we had representatives of, from Home Affairs, Treasury and, uh, and some of the other agencies as well. So what were your main takeaways from what the, from what the bureaucrats had to say? Yeah. In a sense, I I actually, a a bit of a sigh of satisfaction. I felt like this hearing, they were a lot more talkative, a lot more willing to provide suitable answers, if I can put it that way. I think in the first three hearings, there's been a lot of obfuscating and a lot of kind of dancing around questions, whereas this time they just seem to be a a little bit more comfortable in in just answering the question straight up. Again, I probably... Can I have a random guess at why that is? I reckon it's because they just made it up when they, like, you know, they've been asked, and this is no slight on the bureaucrat, they're being asked to do a job by a government and they have to mm. respond to their like, stakeholder is the minister. So if the minister says, I want you yeah. to go and prepare this, th- these regulations, these rules, they have to go and do it. And, you know, straight out of the gate, they're like, oh my God, how are we going to do that? They've probably built all these rules, you know, built this formula and everything, and they just haven't had the time. That's my belief. They haven't had the time to actually work through what the potential consequences are to consult and figure all this stuff out. And now four hearings yep. deep. That's what it feels like to me. It's like suddenly they're going, okay, we made this decision three months ago, not having any idea what the heck we were doing, but now we've been able to come back and find a justification for it. Yep, quite, mate. And you, you, it's quite possible. So one of the things that came out from Treasury, I think, and it was a really interesting moment where I kind of lent into the computer and went, oh, this is going to be interesting, was asked about modelling around uh, an impact, job losses, those types of things of this bill. And it was really interesting that Treasury made it very clear that they did not think there was against budget, again, against budget figures, they did not think that this bill was going to impact significantly. And the reason for that, the equivalent figures of the 270 that we've been using is roughly about the same as what was pumped into the budget figures. If you were to kind of look for a needle in a haystack here, you could possibly say that 270 number- so 270,000 yeah, cap. That's yep, coming. that's been you know crafted. How did we get to that figure? Well, because it's pretty close to the, the number that was in the budget. So that's maybe, you know, I mean, this has been the question all along. How do we get to 270? Why 270? What, what is that magic number? I think we've found that now, that it's pretty close to the one that was in the budget and that they're trying to draw that back rather than recalculate the budget or, you know, re-look at, at that in a different context. Let's try and get it back in line with budget, which again is, you know, you could argue that there's benefits in overshooting that number because there's going to be increased taxes, there's going to be increased all, all, a whole lot of things. But that seemed to be the connection for me was was that number's really close to the to the budget number. What surprises me about that? So there's this sort of lack of modelling around that. I mean, if I'm a business and I want to make decisions about you know what I'm going to invest in, the services I'm going to provide and things like that, I'm at least going to sit down with my spreadsheet and work out what the consequences of my decision are going to be, for, for, for better or for worse. And I'm quite stunned that there hasn't, and once again, you know, bureaucrats are at the, the mercy of government. So if the government doesn't direct them to go do some modelling, then perhaps they don't 
go and do that. But not, so I've gone and said, okay, well, let's just think about this. And I've got some figures from Claire Field. There are 191 providers with a cap under 10. It doesn't take a genius with a spreadsheet to work out how many potential job losses that might result in, impacts the economy and the like. And look, maybe in the grand scheme of things, you know, when we're talking about the size of government budgets, maybe they look at that and say, oh, well, it's, it's kind of inverted commas negligible. You know, a few thousand jobs here and there, you know, tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions. Maybe, maybe that's not significant. It's interesting you say that because later on, Faruqi really tries to dig into this and Treasury came back to say this is a macroeconomic view. So they're not actually, they're not potentially looking at that. And I don't, I got the impression that I don't think that they've actually modeled job losses yet and that they'll, they're actually doing that at the moment. So that, I think that's an area, and I hate to say microeconomic, but I think that that's the lens that now needs to be cast over this is, is yeah, that's great at a macro level. You know, visa fees might not move very much because we're on budget, you know, although they'll go up because obviously the, the numbers, the visa, the dollars have gone up significantly. But in terms of that macro, and, and that might be at government level too, right? So we're not talking about across the economy necessarily. We're talking potentially at government level. Once we start factoring in, you know, if there are 192 colleges closed, then yeah, what does that mean? Where do those people find jobs? All of those sorts of things. But one of the, uh, the I guess the big quotes was from Faruqi, who, who after this line of questioning said, that is outrageous. And you could hear Henderson in the background joining in as well. So I think this is an area, again, that's, that's got senators very nervous, that we're going down this major reform path and there just doesn't seem to be a clear picture on how it's going to land. Yeah, it's kind of a question of decorum, isn't it? It's like you want to make major changes to any industry surely having some figures and data that says, okay, we think that this is going to be the impact, you know, XYZ is going to be the impact. But, you know, we also take into consideration ABC, you know, he, you know here's this upside to it and, and this is going to be positive. But the fact that none of that work seems to have been done just must be ringing alarm bells, just about good process. And, and we've seen that the whole way through this, how we've got providers that are closing campuses, literally closing down campuses and sacking people and we haven't even got a piece of legislation through the parliament. That to me just thinks that something is wrong, wrong, wrong in the way that this has been done. No, I agree. I'm very interested, Dirk. Let's, let's move on to what the Department of Education had to say. They were in one of the later sessions in the day. What came out of that? Yeah, the last session, along with uh, TEXA and DIWA and ASQA. So it was, this was a, probably where, you know, if you're going to get four government departments on the one panel, this is it. So this is, was the, the crescendo of the day. Mate, really, it was a fascinating view. So some of the things that I think we had assumed and written in the legislation seems to be interpreted by the government maybe slightly differently. You know, these tests around if you overshoot your cap level, um, you know, you can be suspended. Well, it was, it was clarified by the government. That doesn't actually mean, you know, suspended full stop. It actually just means that you're suspended from the program for a year, which essentially means you can't take money from international students. You can't enroll any more international students until that year is, has gone, but you can continue your operations. So I'm not sure that that actually lends itself to the, the kind of verbatim thing that's that's in the legislation because there was a, a lot of views around that. The interesting bit, I think, was was a quote that everyone's favourite person at the moment, who is Ben Rimmer, the Deputy Secretary for Education Research and International. But I've got to say, when he was talking, um, I probably fielded about 10 text messages. And I get the impression Ben is not the flavour of the month at a number of institutions and certainly with a lot of people. I don't know what he's done, but he certainly rubs people up the wrong way. And he made a comment, and it was really interesting. He said, if a provider has grown by thousands of students over a year, it's hard to see how that is quality. And Faruqi responded, that's an assumption. And he didn't think it was. He think, like, And so I think it provides an insight into if you're good at recruiting or if you're, you've grown significantly – that there's an underlying assumption here that you must be doing something dodgy. And so linking growth to integrity and quality seems to be something that's going on in the department. But as somebody who's worked in the sector for 20 years, I think they're not linked at all. And if we go back to, you know, the example of Charleston University where, you know, they, they shut down a lot of their, you know, their city campuses. And so they're now at a baseline and they're opening new campuses. They could easily grow 
a couple of thousand students over the next, you know, 18 months or so because they've got new campuses established. So it's really hard. I don't think Ben represented himself very well by saying that because I think there are lots of rationales. Now that was used separately, but the kind of the flavor of the context was that ACU was identified as one university of the university. And he did say there were others that were approaching that mark where there were concerns around them overshooting their cap. And we, as we spoke about, I think well, last week or the week before, ACU's actually gone to the market and said, we're done for 2025, we've reached our cap limit. So that's obviously a discussion that's taken place between the department and ACU over the last little bit. He explained that ACU's growth in the last little bit was of concern. So then if you put that second comment over the top of you know, this scenario, you know, I don't want to say it, but it, it, it flavors this conversation in a way that isn't healthy for anyone. And AC has done really, really well, and they should be applauded for what they've done, not have this kind of, you know, malaise of, of, of smoke over their, their operations for no, for, for no reason other than they've grown. Yeah. When it, when, when it's a Texa, Texa regulated institution, that's, uh, you know, in good shape. <laughs> what can you say? Yeah, and look, I mean, to take that joke one further, they're not going to be getting a letter around financial viability, are they? You wouldn't suspect so. No. <laughs> um, actually, before before we start to get towards wrap up, I did have one more uh, one more question because I I did read in your article talking about systems. Uh, there's a big question here around systems. How on earth government is going to actually manage the implementation of these caps, and how that inter intersects with visa approvals and the like as well. We're not even talking about the Australian universities and how they're going to manage it. Oh, sorry, the Australian institutions, not just universities, how Australian organisations are going to manage this. But it seems like not a heck of a lot has been done when it comes to updating you know, prisms. For those who, who don't know, it's the, the system that allows Australian institutions to essentially approve a student. Correct, uh, correct, correct. They could be confirmation of enrolment. You're correct, yeah. Mm. Correct, they're confirmation of enrolment. So, so essentially demonstrate that a student is is a genuine student, but yep. uh, you know, obviously there's going to need to be some major updates to that. And it doesn't seem like... Yeah, there is. So it's it's fascinating. So there's, there's probably two areas, right? So the Department of Education runs PRISMs and, and they're obviously doing a whole bunch of stuff in that PRISMs area, but yeah, also on home affairs. So home affairs were asked around development. They categorically stated that they're on track for a release in December. I think he was saying the 4th of December, give or take a couple of days, depending on testing, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of... Again, mate, when you look at the bill hasn't passed. So all the assumptions, I, I'm guessing, in the building of these changes and, and this release are going to be based on the assumption that this bill passes. So what happens if the bill passes, but it has an amendment that changes something that cuts across the development that's been done? I mean, essentially, it's back to the drawing board. It's not just turning something off and turning it back on again. It, it could absolutely cut across that going live in the right way. Similarly with PRISMs, sources that I've spoken to believe that PRISMs is not going to be in a healthy state for if the caps come in on, on 1 January. But the department seems to think that they're on track and they're, they're going there. So I think this is this is a, a potential space to, to keep looking at. And again, when we talk about providers being able to I'd, being able to identify the formula and be able to replicate that formula that's, that's been given. A lot of that depends on the data that's in PRISM. So how that works out over the next little bit, I'm not sure. But again, massive space to watch because this is where the success or, or non-success of this of these changes will be felt. Oh, that's pain. Sorry, Len, we'll start again. Oh, well, that's, that's a very big day, um, Dirk. Any, any final thoughts or comments about how it all unfolded? It became really apparent. And so there was actually a period or I think two periods even maybe where senators from different persuasions ended up arguing about uh, about the committee process where the broadcasting was actually shut down. I think that's the first time that's happened across the four, the, the four hearings. So and I, I just felt through this process, there was now more pushback from Labor and certainly the Labor senators, including uh, Senator Billick, just kind of, you know, throwing knuckleballs that were just being hit out of the park when, when they needed. The examples that were asked for around exploitation specifically had no widespread, you know, uh, grounding. But there were one-off examples, but those one-off examples were being really held onto and, oh, well, this is really bad. 
you know, there's at the last look, what, 900 plus thousand students in this country. And we're talking about one example of something. And to hold that up with such, you know, gravitas, I, I don't think is representative of actually what's going on. There's this partiality coming into it, which is a real shame. I was definitely alarmed when I saw some of that, you know, some of the things that were, were raised as examples. I mean, the first time in this committee process that I can remember where these examples of exploitation have, have been sort of highlighted. Yeah. Actually, is that true? No, I think it did come in one of the early ones, didn't it? But you definitely got the feeling this was a line of questioning, right? Yeah. About I, I, trying to trying to, to, to shine a light on these on this exploitation. It's one of those things, you know, this committee is supposed to be reporting in five days' time, four days' time. The report is written. I kind of felt like some of that line of questioning was probably just trying to elicit a response that a written report can say, oh, no, and this is what came out of the hearing rather than the other way around, listening to what came out of the hearing and then and, and then writing a report based off that. That was my kind of gut feeling reading some of that stuff where they're trying to support preconceived preconceived ideas. And of course, Labor has control of, of the committee, which becomes problematic because r- regardless of what dissenting senators think, the government gets to decide what goes in that report, essentially. Yeah, mate, it's going to be interesting when the report's released to, to look at it and to see how accurate it is. And, you know, I'm, I guess I'm really fortunate that I've sat through the four hearings from go to woe and probably got a pretty good insight into, you know, how that report comes out and, and how accurate it is against the discussions and, and the witness testimony. So it'll be fascinating. It will be fascinating. And um, one last quote, if I may, please. Rob, yeah. before, before we throw up, and it's the last quote in the story that I wrote of the wrap of the day, but Henderson, with a kind of, with a plum, if I can put it that way, at the end, at, almost at the end of the day, said, how can the government expect the parliament to pass this bill when many of its provisions are still under review? And I thought, that's a really good way to sum all this up. There's so many moving pieces still, which have clearly unintended negative consequences that aren't just little consequences, they're catastrophic consequences, but yet the, gov- the, the parliament's being able to pass this bill without answers to those. And that's probably a good, a good place to finish up because I think it's, it's pretty right. Well, if I can tie together our, our conversation here with um, our, our conversation with Sham earlier in the podcast, the place for you to be to hear more about this and to ask questions is going to be AIEC because as Sham was saying, both Minister Minister for Education, Jason Clare, will be there. Tim Watts, of course, who's the Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs. Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs. He's out, of the, he's out of the firing line when it comes to this. But I think you, you've got to be there this year at AIEC because having Jason Clare there, I don't think he's going to be taking questions, but it will be very, very interesting to be in that room when the architect of this trying to think of a nice way to put it, Dirk. I'm just not going to leave that adjective for our, our listeners to fill in for themselves. The architect of this... Proposed set of reforms. This noun will be in the room and will we'll be addressing us. So make sure you're at AIC this year. And Dirk, once again, mate, thanks for, thanks for taking one for the team, as in the thousands of international educators out there who couldn't be sitting and listening in on that hearing and, and keeping us up to date on all of that. It's always greatly appreciated. You're very welcome, mate. And as usual, all of the news at thekoalanews.com. Make sure you sign up if you haven't already done so. Jump on LinkedIn and follow The Koala as well. You'll get a, a wonderful little stream in your LinkedIn feed of all of the breaking news that applies to Australian international education. Some great writers from across the sector are writing for The Koala, so it's definitely the place to be. And we'll see you next time on Global Horizons. See you next time, Dirk. Thanks, Rob. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time-consuming and complex, so if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.